Welcome everybody to a new edition of UFO Man Live. My name is Tim or UFO Man and to my side is my friend, my co-host, Tommy Highway. Tommy? Hey folks, Tommy Highway here. I want to thank everybody for coming out as always. Have a great show for you tonight, folks. A very interesting guest. His name is Mr. Daryl Sims. He's also known as the Alien Hunter and he is the world's leading expert on alien abductions. His 38 plus years of field research has focused on the physical evidence and has led to groundbreaking discoveries of alien implants and alien fluorescence. As a former military police officer and CIA operative, Sims has a unique insight to the alien organization, which he believes functions similarly to an intelligence agency. Sims is also a compassionate and skilled therapist and has helped hundreds of alien experiencers all over the world come to terms with what they have witnessed. Folks, it is my pleasure and our honor to bring you Mr. Daryl Sims. Daryl, welcome to the show, sir. Well, Tommy and uh, Tim, you guys are awesome. I've, I've, uh, I'm looking forward to this more than probably your, your audience. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Tim? Tim, are you still this brother? <laughs> Uh oh, I think we lost him, folks. Okay, well, I'll tell you, uh, Daryl, let's just go ahead and get started. Sir, can you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, your background and basically how you got into uh, into uf ufology and became the alien hunter? I'm very glad to, Tommy. The, uh, the fact is that uh, my background is uh, as a senior military police officer uh, from a policing point of view. Uh, three years as a senior military police officer, I volunteered during the Vietnam War. And uh, while I was in the military at the time, I was sheep dipped. Sheep dip is a term used by the intelligence community. It means they dip into the military and take out what they want and use them for their operations. And so I spent two years of my three years in the military in covert operations uh, in the Central Intelligence Agency, in the spycraft school, basically. I was a military uh, martial arts instructor and a weapons instructor in the in that agency the uh, my I have other skills as well which we, we use for our work uh, handwriting analysis uh, I'm a, a martial artist like I said but when I was a weapons instructor and a martial arts instructor in the intelligence community that was part of what I did but I've transferred a lot of these skills over to the UFO community and to, to help people in some of their endeavors as well. Some of this translates to that. On a personal level, how I got involved with the UFO phenomena was not my choice at all. I was a captive audience, you might say. At uh, age four, about four and a half, uh, I uh, woke up one night and I sat up in bed, got heard something in the room that and I didn't know what was going on. And we lived in a little tiny place uh, uh, in Midland, Texas, in the middle of nowhere. And uh, as I sat up in bed, I was shocked to see a little man walking away from me. He was bigger than I was, so he had to, he was at least a kid, if not a man. But the weird thing about him is he was walking toward the wall, and I thought, well, he's going to bump into the wall. And as soon as I said that in my head, he must have heard me mentally because he turned around and said, as he looked at me and he said, it's awake. But he said this all mentally. And that's the first time I'd heard someone else's voice in my head. And uh, when he turned and looked at me, I was stunned by what I saw. Uh <clears throat> I saw a spindly, skinny uh, little man about uh, four and a half feet tall, and uh, he had large black eyes, uh, white. He was as white as he could be. He was not the so-called alien gray you hear about. Uh, he was very white. There was a small ambient light in the room from the outside on our well house, so I could see him very clearly. And he had large black eyes that were perfectly round. Now, that, that wasn't, I, I just don't know, you know, uh, people describe these aliens with uh, elliptical eyes and things like that. But what I saw was rounded eyes in 1952. Uh, 
back then, it, it very much like what you're showing on the screen there, very similar, about an inch and a half across, perfectly round. Uh, it, the whole thing just floored me because I just wasn't prepared for any of this. What I didn't know, and I later figured out as an investigator, he had just brought me back from an abduction, placed me in bed, and I'm not supposed to remember anything. Back in the 40s and 50s, most people did not remember their abduction events. The alien would bring that large black eye right next to your face and would program you, telling you you will not remember, and so on. And as a result, I never told my parents. Uh, my mother, who passed away just very recently, uh, saw me on a TV program one night and said, oh, I, think, I knew you were an investigator, but they said you were abducted by the aliens. And I said, um, actually, that's true. And I told her just before she passed away about the event. But uh, I didn't I didn't want her to know. I didn't want him, want him troubled from the, about that event. But the bottom line was what I noticed about the alien as I was standing there, sitting in my bed, looking at him as he was standing in front of me. And, uh, and I need to reference this because children see things differently than adults. Adults look at an alien and say, oh my gosh, it's here to save us, fix the ozone hole, or, or it's going to eat us or barbecue us or something like that. I never thought anything like that. I wasn't scared. I wasn't frightened. I wasn't anything. I just couldn't figure out why in the wintertime he didn't have any clothes on. And as I looked at him, because uh, I was freezing, I was in bed with my, my quilt wrapped around me, and I was still cold. But I noticed as I looked at him, he didn't have a TT, and he didn't have a belly button. That was really weird to me because... Everybody I knew had something, but he didn't. Why is that? And it took me uh, years of investigating the UFO phenomena to finally put that thing together to figure out exactly what that means. If you don't have genitalia, you don't procreate. And if you don't have a, a, a belly button or a navel, you weren't born. You were hatched, cloned, made, or manufactured. And I think that's exactly his story. Wow. Um, what the, all right. Um, how did they communicate their intentions to you, uh, if at all, when they took you? That's a, it's, that's a good question. What, what did they communicate? What they communicated wasn't what they were after. And rarely do they communicate what their real purpose is. They're, in only in the very rarest occasions will they actually tell you what their actual purpose is, and it, and, the, and you can go back and prove it, so to speak. As an ex-cop, when people tell me, oh, oh, officer, I wasn't speeding, you know, well, 99% of the time, that's a lie. I mean, they were. <laughs> so when uh, these guys are like that, in, the, in that respect, uh, they, they don't tell the truth. They fabricate things. And especially back in the 1950s and 60s, one of the things they would do was to keep their information from you, even to a point that they would do something, which I'm going to refer to, which your audience will probably identify with, is an app. The app they installed in me uh, was to not, re not to remember. There were several apps they installed. And these are like little tiny programs that are installed in abductees. Most of them don't know they have them until someone like me questions them and asks them certain questions. And they're stunned that I know so much about them, yet I never met them. Well, the fact is we've had similar experiences as abductees and contactees. And uh, those apps apply to most of us because most of us have already got the apps running in, in the background in our subconscious. And one of the apps, as I mentioned, was You Won't Remember. And uh, another huge app that they that you can ask abductees anywhere, any conference, anywhere, and I do. I ask them the several questions. Uh, one is usually statistical questions, and they're shocked that I know these rare finds about, their, about them. And number two, that I ask them some personal questions. How many of you in the audience actually 
regardless of the fact your parents loved you, cared for you, took care of you, and fed you all these years, don't really believe they're your parents. There's something wrong with that picture. And the second thing I ask them in that, along that line is how many of you people absolutely know for a fact, regardless of the fact you were nurtured, well taken care of, and all of that, you feel all alone. And almost every hand that's an abductee or contactee will go up just like that. And the reason is because those are programs that are running, they're running inside. The all alone thing doesn't mean you, I, I, by that I don't mean you have, uh, you, you're, you, you feel, like, it's not a matter of being alone per se. It's a matter of, uh, uh, not, you're not lonely. You're just all alone. Even your parents and others. Even, look, look at me. I, my mother was uh, what, 92 years old when she passed away. And I, I told her just before she died that I'd been abducted. Why would anyone keep a secret like that from their parents all those years? I mean, it's a program that's run on us. There are a number of those programs and we catalog them. That's cool. Very interesting. Well, um, <clears throat> if I may, one of the things, and, and we've uh, been very fortunate on the show that we've been able to interview quite a few abductees over the years. Um, one of the things that we've actually come up with our terms of our own research, if you will, is that they tend to be generational experiences. In other words, if uh, if, a, if one person is abducted, chances are a parent or or someone uh, you know a, above them in the family has also had an experience. Uh, have you had any family members that also had experiences? Uh, I have. Uh, my brother is an abductee. Uh, he married a young woman uh, many years ago and they later divorced. She was an abductee. They divorced. He married another lady. She's an abductee. All her family are abductees. I mean, it's just amazing. My uh, son is an abductee, and I think my father was an abductee. None of the women in our family were abductees, but the, several of the boys were. 45% of the people taken in these events are Native American, Indian, Irish, uh, Celtic, and Scottish. 45%. Wow. Oh, then I got to worry because I'm 45% Scottish. <laughs> I'm 45% Scotch. <laughs> that's, I think that's a drink. <laughs> yeah. So no. um, has anything, did anything happen to your son? I mean, did he uh, have any experimentation done, any type of implants inserted and such? My events uh, started in 1952 and ended 13 years later when I was 17 years old. Uh, I thought after that that, yay, it's over, they're gone, whatever that is, whatever they were, and everything's okay. That's what I hoped. Then when my uh, I married a lovely lady that I've been married to for over 50 years now, and uh, we had a son. And at six years old, uh, one night I woke up in a, in a cold sweat and I, I knew he was not in his room. I ran as fast as I could because I had felt that feeling all those years dur during my abduction time. When the alien is coming, many abductees sense when they're going to be there, when they're, when they're near, and they really get freaked uh, over that. I ran past his room because I knew he wasn't in there. And I ran uh, into the kitchen area, the, the living room area. And there he was in the dining room. They had just brought him back and he was uh, standing there looking out the back doors and uh, these sliding glass doors. And I asked him, what was he looking at? He said, the little red light. Well, the little red light is just a, it's just a, a technique used to focus you so that, uh, you won't remember. And uh, anyway, my wife came out at that point and wondered why I was up running around in the middle of the night. And uh, she was looking at him and I was talking to him and I told him, go back to bed and go back to sleep. It's okay. And he did. Now, my wife looks at me and says, what's going on? 
I had never told her. And now it's happening to my son. So now I've got a lot of explaining to do. So that was pretty difficult for me to explain to her. She's very smart, very sharp, and uh, she believed every word I said. And of course, she saw the evidence on her son. Uh, my son's had a very tough life as a result of all of this. Uh, you'll get all kinds of stories about how the aliens are here to help us save the planet, fix the ozone hill, the ozone hole. Uh, here, they're here to upgrade us and all kinds of ideas like that. Uh, and in rare cases, that may be true. But by and large, uh, I don't think that that's what's the real story. I don't think the alien has ever told anybody the truth. And I can give you an example. As a police officer, um, if I come upon a murder scene and there's a man with a knife sticking out of his back and there are eight witnesses standing around and I asked him the big question, what happened? If I get eight different answers, guess how many people get to go downtown? Eight. All eight of them. But that man did not die eight different ways. He just didn't. And even if I get the, the so-called truth out of one of them, that doesn't mean that they're not going to be thoroughly, thoroughly interrogated. And, uh, and so we'll find out what the whole story is. My point of that little illustration is this. When I go to uh, Ireland and, uh, and talk to these folks, they say, you've got to watch out for the wee folk because they may not bring you back if they get mad at you. And they go to Turkey and, and, and they talk to the Islamic people and they say, You've got to watch out for the for the for the the jinn of Islam. They may not bring you back. And you you go all these different countries. I've been to Japan, all over Europe, and the incredible thing is they all have the same story. It's just a different flavor. The cultural bias is on, in each story, but the fact is they have eight different versions of what happened, so to speak. It didn't happen eight different ways. It happened one way. These guys are all on the same page doing the same thing, but they're telling eight different stories to different groups of people in different countries. Why are they doing that? Because they're not telling the truth, of course. The, the alien, I learned this very early, especially when I was inducted into the Central Intelligence Agency, and I began to learn some of the spy craft. One of the things I learned, I noticed right off the bat, with the spy craft that we were learning and the things we're doing, the deception main thing is I'm bringing up here, how to develop cover stories and lies and whoppers and so on and make everybody believe them. It was the same exact thing the alien had been doing all along in my experience. They had been lying, not telling the truth, developing these whoppers of stories about how they're here to, they're going to do this and yet, you know, they're going to fix the planet and all that. They hadn't done it in, 5,000, 10,000, 50,000, however long they've been here, they haven't done any of that stuff. So what? So it's a ruse. There's something else going on. So the bottom line for me was the intelligence community. I was wondering, you know, what is it, it's the chicken or the egg thing, you know? Who did who did what first? I mean, did, they, did the intelligence community copy this from the alien or what? I mean, spies uh, all do the same thing. They lie. They have to protect their secrets. By the same token, the alien has got a huge uh, need to keep their secrets secret. And that's why they keep developing these whoppers about all these different things they're going to do that they seem to never really get around to do. So that's, the, uh, that's my setting I want to place you in. And then, of course, when my son came along and... Uh, I asked him what happened, and he could only remember sketchy parts of it. And he begged me to work with him in hypnosis, and I really didn't want to because I was scared to death what I was going to find. And my worst nightmares came to pass. As I began to work with him in, in memory recovery, I found his story almost identical to mine in certain parts. And, uh, and I'd never told any, any of the kids this, not, nothing. And in fact, my wife learned it that night. My point is that uh, whatever the alien told him that they were doing, we're here to save you and fix the world and upgrade you and all of those wonderful things, that 
patently was not the case in my son's case. What I found out later, and I was horrified to find this out, is he took my cro- my uh, my compound bow, bow and arrow with razor, big Fred Bear razor head arrow points, pointed it toward the door the next night. If anybody had opened that door, me, his sister, his mother, didn't matter, alien, didn't matter, that thing would have automatically fired and killed someone. <clears throat> it's not like someone that got well treated by the alien. At six years old, you're ready to defend yourself to to the death about coming someone coming through that door. So that's just one illustration. I could give many, many others. Most definitely traumatic experience for the for the kid for sure. I mean, you know, that's just odd behavior for a six year old. That's um, but that that is one of the things again that that we've noticed is that it does tend to be generational. Of course, there are those one off abductions, just sort of abductions of opportunity, if you will. Those do happen, but it t- it tends to be a family affair. Um, let, let's go back, if you don't mind, and talk about uh, your wife's reaction to this again. I mean, uh, how did I mean how did she take it, and and how did you move forward after something like that, after uh, you know providing that information to her? Well, uh, my wife and I have a pretty unique relationship. Uh, uh, we don't lie to each other. We don't have to. If, if if you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what the lie was. Truth is a real simple situation. And since we don't lie to each other, she knew I was telling the truth. And of course, she could see the ill effects on my son fairly rapidly. Uh, one of the things that bothered me uh, a few weeks later, uh, my son is a protector. He was, as a little kid, even in the second grade he was defending people on the bus from bullies and things like that kids much bigger than himself and uh one day he got off the bus we were walking back home and he said dad you remember what happened to me that night and i said yes and he said something has happened to me my consciousness has been altered i said what do you mean by that he said, I no longer care for people like I used to. That was one of the most troubling things I ever heard from a kid uh, seven years old. Wow. I was wondering if there was any physical evidence of any experimentation done on your son. Well, uh, certainly the people come back with marks, cuts, scars, bruisings. We call them... UVMs or unidentified body marks. Uh, these can be t- two kinds. One is either procedural uh, or used equipment, needles and things like that on you, or from casual contact or bruising simply from touch, that sort of thing. That would, you see there, these are procedural markings on people. Uh, that's a scoop mark. I've got one on my right leg from my event in 1952. But my scoop mark was approximately six, uh, five eighths of an inch across. And you can imagine a skinny little kid's leg at uh, four years old, four and a half years old, uh, a mark, a scoop that big would be huge on their, on their leg. And I thought that uh, I couldn't figure out why that mark was there, why the scoop was there. I was wondering, where is the scab? And as I put my finger inside that huge five-eighths of an inch uh, scooped out area in my leg, I heard a voice in my head, again, which <laughs> I don't hear voices. I don't, nobody talks to me in my head. And uh, as soon as I touched that mark and began to massage it and, and put my finger in it and everything, a voice, almost like it was a program, again, an app, it just it set off an automatic statement that says, you fell and hurt yourself. Well, first of all, I don't talk to myself in a uh, second person. I didn't fall and hurt myself. The scoop mark missing on my my uh, leg in 1952 it didn't have a scar, didn't have anything. So we've studied these scoop marks in detail and found that uh, they're usually created by a particular device that the alien uses. It's a pencil-like device that has these little like little blades on the end of a pencil-like vice, zip like that, and it makes a scoop, and then it has a bright flash of light, 
and uh, what our, ev our evidence to date seems to suggest to us is that the wounds are cauterized with an intense ultraviolet light, which uh, uh, that literally uh, cauterizes the wound so that there's no blood or anything there, and uh, you've got basically a smooth scar at that point. This is uh, the square markings. Uh, you s sometimes see these. This one in particular uh, was seen on a, a square marks like that was seen on a man who had gotten next to a UFO and touched it, which is a usually a huge mistake to do. Uh, it activates the metal to defend itself against anyone like that, animal or human. It left uh, those square marks on him, and later he was tested for radiation poisoning. You got the dose. Yeah, wow. wasn't that Michalak? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we talked about him mm -hmm. on Thursday, actually. This is one that I noticed. These aren't square. These are round. Yes. Again, the, the these are procedural uh, systems that are used on people. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most interesting ones I got was a, a doctor who came to me and said, uh, I've got, uh, he said this, he said, uh, I've got this mark, and he showed me this mark on his arm, and uh, it was a perfectly round mark about as big as a huge silver dollar and uh, had needle holes all the way around it and bruising in the center. And uh, he said, what in the blankety blank is that? And I said, it's called a procedural technique. And he said, well, we're not weird like you people. And I said, welcome to the club. You are can not. those can, can those marks also be smaller and round with needle marks in the surface? They can, but the interesting thing about this particular mark, with all the needle marks around it in, on himself, he finally told me the truth. He said, "I found one on my wife, and I found one on my daughter." Wow, that's what troubled him. Mm -hmm. He's a doctor, and he's also a cop, and he was wandering around with a pistol in the middle of the night looking for whoever was in their house. He knew they were in there, but he couldn't find them. And uh, there are all kinds of marks that appear on people, procedural and or uh, through bruisings. Uh, through the, Some of them are pretty rough when they touch you. Well, um, here's, I have one left to show, and we both know who this is from. This is from Terry Lovelace. Mm -hmm. Yes, I... I I broke Terry Lovelace's story uh, years ago in Houston, Texas, many years ago. Incredible yeah, story that it is as well. Yes. Yeah, he's a good it friend is. of ours. Well, it now that uh, we've we've actually brought up Terry and, and um, we've talked about implants, let's go a little further with that. Let's talk about Roger, Dr. Roger Lear, and uh, let's talk about your interactions with him. Uh, well, a lot of people don't know, but Roger... Uh, when I, uh, I was introduced to him by a, a woman named Alice Levy, his very best friend. And she said, I want you to look at these x-rays this guy's got. And uh, he said, oh, what is that? And she said, well, it looks like it might be an alien implant. Well, he was, uh, he, he didn't believe a word of it. He said, that's, he looked at me and said, that's, uh, that's probably a surgical clip from an osteotomy. And I said, that's what I thought. The problem is she has no history of surgical intervention whatsoever, none. And but she does have a, a history of alien contact. And uh, he said, "Well, why don't you remove them?" And I said, "Well, I actually need a podiatrist. That's a foot doctor, which is what he was. He's not an MD. He's a foot doctor uh, to remove those." And uh, he said, "Well, if you apply them out here and do all of that, I'll uh, I'll remove them. I, 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 the one out of the foot." And I said, okay. And so I paid for the flights and their hotel and the medications, everything. And uh, brought two people out there. One had an object in his hand, which he had provided a, a so-called MD to remove that object. And he removed one from the foot. And uh, uh, we later became partners. I asked him to join me in my efforts. And uh, he did not believe a word of this stuff. He thought it was all 100% bogus. Uh, later, when he saw the uh, 
uh, results coming from this. Uh, he was he was a stun he was stunned. He went to the, we went to the pathologist the next day and took the biology. The, the The implants are one thing, but they, they also have a biology that surrounds them, and the biology is uh, fascinating. It's probably more fascinating than the implants themselves. Uh, when we got to the pathologist, the pathologist looked at it and said, oh, he said, well, that's just an inflammatory response. You know how uh, uh, the body protects itself from a, you know, it's a spatter effect, like a, from a hand grenade, a little piece of metal or something gets in somebody or, and the body will just wall it off, protect it, the body from the foreign object, if it can't get rid of it. And I uh, said, uh, I would like for you to actually check the biology. He said, well, it, that's probably what it is. I said, I don't want to be probable. I want to know exactly what the biology is. And he said, well, okay. He starts checking it, and he's absolutely stunned. And he said, that's the biology. The, the, biology the, the whole mass of biology is in a proteinaceous coagulum. And he said, in effect, what you have here, he said, that's keratin. He said, where did you find this? And I said, deep inside the body next to the bone. He said, that's just impossible. That did not happen. He said, keratin is skin, your surface skin, your fingernails, or your hair. And this is keratinous material. It can't be found next to the bone, deep in the body. That's impossible. I don't care where you found it. And I said, well, we've got 17 witnesses, one lawyer, two doctors, myself as hypnotic anesthesia therapist, and a surgical nurse. And... Uh, and he said, I don't care if God was present. He said, that did not come out. It couldn't have. It's impossible. That's what's also in film. So that's what I wanted to hear from a pathologist. It's impossible. And uh, the story gets bigger and better from there. Uh, at that point, uh, Roger looked at me and said, how in God's name did you know what you would pull out of somebody when we? this is the first surgery that we actually produced. And I said, um, this is not my first rodeo. I said, I was abducted in one of my events at age 12 in 1960 and a nasal implant was placed in my nasal passage, uh, about an eight inch needle like device. Anyway, I said, the fact is that I, I have a pretty good idea. I said, I spoke before I ever met you, Roger, to 250 surgeons at John Muir Medical Hospital and in that presentation, which was on med uh, medical complications of alleged human alien contact, I gave five things that we would find if implants were really, really true, if they were real. And the analysis that we're getting right now is proving 100% of what I said. Uh, I said, I, this is not my first rodeo. I've been here before. I know what I'm looking for. I know who... What we're looking at, I know who we're looking at, and I know, I know a lot about what's going on here. So it's taken me a while to do it. But anyway, he, I, I personally think he saw the money and the fame and all that, and he wanted to be partners. And, and I, I needed a doctor, so I pulled him in. And uh, But he did not do the majority of our surgeries. So we hired an MD to do this stuff because he was a podiatrist. He's, he was not able to do, operate anywhere above the ankle. That's the dietary is limited to that. So we hired uh, uh, MDs to do the surgeries for us. In fact, I've we later split up as partners and uh, I've done 27, I've conducted 27 surgical interventions as far as uh, India to here. In fact, one of our next cases, we, we, I hope to be in Brazil removing a, an incredible object. In fact, the lady is on the front of my book on alien implants. It shows her with a large, uh, it looks like a lifesaver inside her skull. And that object uh, was there for two years and it later was moved that right there. It moved to the other hemisphere of the skull. Wow, that really? An absolutely incredible case. That Never is incredible. Amazing case. Wow. Well, well, let me ask you this, Daryl. Um, in terms of these implants, it, were they actually admitting any kind of a radio frequency or anything that you could detect? No. Uh, the uh, the uh, I'm, I'm not opposed to. Uh, we, we're we're doing some specialized studies which we've not discussed much about. 
uh, we're not saying that there, there couldn't be uh, that, but one of the things that uh, Roger and some friends of his said that I did not agree with, he said, well, we were, were hearing the signals from, and they said it was a secret, uh, <laughs> this sounds awful. If it's a scientist in the, in the audience, they're going to have a real problem with this. And I, I know I did. He said, well, it's a, it was a secret code that uh, that NASA has. Well, how would you know what the secret code that NASA has in an implant? That, none right. of that makes any sense. I used to be in the intelligence business, and uh, you don't go around discovering big secrets from NASA and others. Uh, just, you know, just because we, you can say anything you want. I can, I can say, we, oh, there's like nine different signals that, the, that we're finding in these implants, but I would be lying if I said that. That doesn't mean that uh, information is not transferred by these implants. It certainly is trans transmitted. Is it transmitted in a radio signal as Roger described? I seriously 100% doubt that. The reason is why in a world with an alien with advanced technology, thousands of light years ahead of us, use something as simple as a basic uh, diode or something like a, a radio transmitter. I've often thought about that myself, to be honest. I mean, you would seem that they would have some sort of secure communications link or something that would be so far above you what could, we could detect that, you know. Thank you. You could hack that so easy it would be. So that's, I had a problem with that, but it, but you have to understand if you're selling books, it sells good. People love to buy that stuff. Right. And certainly if you, if you're a doctor, you would never not tell the truth. Or one would think that. Have but you ever did, have you I, ever, I, sorry, go ahead. I did. I, I finally had to dismiss myself because of, he started making claims that were just things we could not, we could not substantiate. And uh, I just some of the predictions, though, that I did make and when I it was at John Muir Medical Hospital uh, two years before I met uh, Roger is uh, if the objects I told these doctors, if these objects you're looking at in x-rays here are in are alien in origin, there will be no chronic or acute inflammatory cells around the object. Remember what the pathologist said? Well, that looks like an inflammatory process. That's a natural state of affairs. The problem is, it was not an inflammatory process, neither chronic or acute. Uh, it, it was it's absolutely an astounding that, that even Roger was stunned by it. He said, how in the world could you know this stuff? I said, there'll be no nerve cells present. Uh, th there will be nerve cells present and inappropriate nerve cells to the affected area. We found that to be true as well in this proteinaceous coagulum. Objects the object itself that would be found will be absent of any discernible technology. Now, how are you going to have a radio transmitter in an implant that has no technology? Uh, not likely. Uh, the metallic or plastic or ceramic implants currently under my study are passe. They're from five to 50 years old and out of date, literally. That is the biological covering you see around two implants are removed, one out of the hand and the other one out of the foot. So which, recovery. what's your theory on them then? What do you think they are and what do you think they're, they're doing? What is their purpose? Oh, great, great, great questions. Uh, absolutely wonderful questions. Uh, I have a huge long definition in my book on implants of what implants are all about. But the, the, the basic, the real answer in the simplified uh, short form that everybody really wants to know is simply they are a, a they are a direct device for uh, in, installing information in someone directly or picking up information from someone very directly without your knowledge. They're not being used to tag us as a lot of people think. No, no. Uh, Stanton Friedman uh, was uh, and I were on a panel one night and. And a lady said, what are alien implants? And, and Stanton, due to, I, I really love the guy because he was honest about everything. He said, I don't know. I, maybe it's a transponder. I don't know. He said, Daryl, what is it? I said, Stanton, they're definitely not transponders. They're not tracking devices. 
if they were tracking devices, how did they find you to begin with? Right. That makes sense. That yep. They already know where you're at. They know your lineage. If anything, they're tracking you with a neural print or with a, a, a fluorescent DNA tagging. That would be make more sense than anything to me. It would the implant implants are extremely rare. Your audience needs to understand this. Implants are very rare. I get probably ten inquiries a month of people swearing, "Oh my God, I've got implants everywhere. I've got them all over the place." That's just not true. Uh, it is extremely rare to find two or three in a person. It's extremely rare to find implants in anybody uh, that are alien related. Now, we find objects in people and they send me x-rays. I look at hundreds of x-rays every year. Most of these objects are things we find in people are BDs, uh, pencil lead where they got stuck in the hand or something uh, by a friend in school. And they forgot that that uh, uh, that lead inside a pencil will stay inside your body forever unless you dig it out. I mean, it, 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 you'll swear it's an implant, but especially if you've had a, a real abduction since then. You'll say, oh, my God, look at that. It's an implant. And it's still pencil lead. I mean, if that's what it is. But real implants, uh, are, they're a totally different story. Um, one of the things we think the implants do as well, and it, it, again, it depends on where it's located, what part of the body is located, and, and, and uh, as to what its function might be. Uh, and again, they're very rare, very rare. They, aliens do not need an implant to control you. They don't. Well, I'm being controlled by implants. You're not. Most people don't even know they have an implant. Uh, they just don't. The only reason I knew I had one when I was 12 is because I was awake when they were putting it in. So I was 100% awake. I saw it. I, I overheard what they were saying. I, I got that. But most implants, most people don't even know, like the lady that had the three in her foot that we removed in California, she didn't have a clue. She, Her doctor discovered that by accident. He asked her, when did you get the osteotomy? She said, what, are, what is that? He said, well, the surgical clips in your feet. Well, they weren't surgical clips. They were studied by the National Institute for Discovery Science under my direction. And what uh, they found at Los Alamos and New Mexico Tech and a qualitative and quantitative analysis is that these objects were from a rare needle-like formation of a meteorite. So they're definitely extraterrestrial. And they wanted to know where in the world I got these rare needle-like projections from a meteorite. Of course, I didn't tell them. I didn't want them to know. I wanted a blinded study here. And their testing proved numerous amazing things about those objects. The main thing uh, is, which I already knew and that, that NIDS finally figured out, where's the technology? And like I said in my, anal my statements about implants, uh, there would be no discernible technology present if they're alien. If you do find a discernible technology in an implant, you better be checking the military or a corporation because that's who that is. Originally, there used to be a lot of RFID chips found uh, implanted in people that were removed. And I know that those are from an American corporation. Absolutely, they are. I've got two of them. A, 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 a man sent me uh, an a RFID chip. These are like little tiny, like a little tiny quarter inch, um, like, like the thickness of a pencil lead about a quarter inch long. Inside them is technology that's designed to, we inject them inside uh, in, inside uh, horses, inside uh, rare dogs, uh, and things like that, because they can be tracked. They only have a range of about five feet, but you can find them with a, a scanner, a detector. Uh, and that, in other words, if you have a $4 million horse, you probably want an RFID chip in your horse, and they, and they require that now, because if that horse gets stolen, you uh, and and they run a scanner over it. They're going to know exactly where that horse came from, and you know, where and, and, and all that information is inside that RFID chip. Very simple uh, process. But in one case, uh, I had a man contact me from uh, 
this was a fascinating story. He sent me an RFID little device and he sent it to me and he asked the question. He said, um, I need to know what this is. And he said, I said, where did you find it? And he said, I am a, a chief chef in uh, San Francisco at a famous restaurant. I said, I've probably eaten there. He said, you probably have. And uh, he said, uh, one of our customers bit down into the, his, his uh, swordfish, and that came out of his mouth. And I said, that is an RFID chip used by the uh, fisheries uh, agency in the government to implant it in fish, to track them, and uh, to, to check fish with a scanner whenever they're caught and so on. And I said, unfortunately, they missed that one, and your client almost swallowed it. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, so RFID chips are man-made. So when people see something like that, they can know that uh, they're being implanted by uh, some corporation for some unknown reason. The thing that bothers me, Daryl, is if these things are being implanted, the ones that are man-made, what is the agenda? Now, that's uh, one of the things I brought up at the presentation for the doctors and scientists, I said, one of the questions that people always bring up is, what if you find some discernible technology, something else in there that's not alien? I said, well, then, of course, it's something to be worried about, that you're talking about somebody from an intelligence operation, foreign or otherwise, uh, or an incorporation that's in bed with the, an intelligence community, the Chinese or whoever. and uh, that's that's where that sort of thing will come from in my opinion uh now there are devices that are much smaller than the rfid chip now uh that can be used uh technology has greatly improved uh, if you have an rfid chip in you uh the range is only about like five feet so that's not going to be that effective there are far more important and far more effective tools in the uh, intelligence agencies. Uh, and I mean all of them, not the CIA, Mossad, KGB, Chinese, right. everybody. Uh, they all play with this stuff. And uh, it, to me, is the most, if I found something like this, I would definitely, uh, I, would, I would put it on the internet immediately. The reason is, and I, and I, and I'll give you a quick, this is true, hand of God, true story. A friend of mine is an abductee. He's also uh, works in the space industry. And one night he was sitting there looking at his, uh, he's doing his, writing his notes and he's looking at his lamp and he thought, now this guy's a high tech guy. So he looks at the lamp and he says, that's the weirdest looking filament I've ever seen in a lamp. He looks at the light bulb and he realizes that's not a filament. There's something else in the light bulb besides the filament. And I said, what did you do? And he said, well, I pulled the light out and I looked at it and I said, oh my God, somebody's spying on me. I said, yes, they are. And he said, uh, I said, what did you do? He said, well, I took it to the FBI. I said, I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't do that. You should not do that. I said, then what happened? He said, they were stunned, didn't say hardly anything, took the object. And I called him a few weeks later and said, hey, you know, what did you find out about the object? And he said, what object was that? Uh -oh. He's found two of them so far. Uh, my point is that um, uh, I wouldn't... The, the FBI... And, and I'm going to say this, I, I say this with great trepidation. Uh, the FBI has become so politicized in the last five or six years that uh, I am wary of them as I am the intelligence community. The reason I, I got out, I I, they, they have become politicized. And they, uh, I mean, it's just it's 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 completely insane. I, I I don't want to make a big political statement here out of everything, but I'm what I'm saying is as a former cop, I'm 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 as 
you know how, how some people are afraid of cops, you know, they, they get pulled over and they're scared, you know, I don't know, you know, like the IRS agent pulling the one to audit you or that sort of thing. But right. I'm, I'm, I'm more worried about the FBI than I am a cop. I, I would tend to agree with that at this point. And I believe you're <clears throat> you're heading it right on the head when you state that, that the FBI has absolutely been politicized and, you know, to the max. And and I, you know, it's it's now a political wing in and of itself. And that's unfortunate. But um, let's go ahead and, and take a take a step into a different subject here. Let's talk about some famous um, sightings and or incidents out there. And uh, one of those I'd like to really get your opinion on is the Battle of L.A. And for those folks that uh aren't aware of this. This is back during the Second World War where the United States government opened up uh, with every anti-aircraft battery that they could muster on an object that seemed to be hovering above L.A. Um, Daryl, what are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, the story is quite true. Of course, the, the spin, and this is what you always have to look for, the spin is that there was uh, uh, the Japanese had aircraft up there. Look, when you fire a hundred and some rounds, of anti-aircraft fire at a, at a at a highlighted area with big giant spotlights, you can't miss. It, I mean, if the object's not moving, it's not flying around. It's pretty much stationary, and all the rounds hit nothing. Uh, that should tell you a lot about what you're shooting at. And of course, they again they said that it was uh, that the aircraft got away and all that. And, it wasn't an aircraft. It was a UFO. Right. And weren't there more than one that night? I suspect that there were three. But uh, that's just my opinion. Based on the stories that I've heard, I suspect there were at least three uh, involved in the event. But regardless, uh, however many there were, a hundred and some rounds fired. Uh, it's amazing to me you couldn't hit anything. Now, these guys are not stupid. They know how to work an anti-aircraft gun. I fired an M60 uh, expert uh, myself. Um, uh, I mean, when I'm talking about particular weapons like that, I, I kind of know what I'm talking about. And uh, when an object is stationary or several objects are stationary, and you've got big bright lights shining on them at nighttime, and there they are, it's kind of hard to miss with an anti-aircraft gun. I mean... <laughs> They got to be the worst shots in the whole world, or mm -hmm. uh, we weren't shooting a Japanese that night. Right, right. and it, that that's obviously the case. I mean, um, they, they can call it a you know Hitler's uh, Zeppelin or whatever they want to call it, or you know, or, or anything Japanese, whatever. And it just none of that makes any sense. I mean, there were so many rounds that were expelled into the air that they began to burst and actually drop on civilian uh, neighborhoods. And actually, I think they didn't they kill a couple of people, if I'm not mistaken, or yeah. definitely wounded some folks. People got injured as a result. Yeah, the, uh, that, that, the whole story, again, it just, uh, look, I used to be in the intelligence community. And one of the things I tell people, I said, I'm not in it anymore, and there's a number of reasons why I'm not. But I said, if I can speak when I was in the intelligence community, I'm going to speak like I was still in it. Uh, basically, you guys, the American people, ultimately, however that happened, developed a, a central intelligence agency, 1947, I think it was. And uh, you developed the first, this big intelligence operation. I mean, we got like at least 17 of them now, different kinds, of naval investigations, airports, I mean, all kinds, everything. My point is simply this, uh, an intelligence agency is, there for one purpose is to keep secrets and to keep everybody in the dark about it. That means they lie. They lie all the time. They lie consistently. They make up whoppers. If a, if a UFO landed in Roswell and the army found out about it first, they would probably publish a story in a newspapers all over the world saying we found a flying disc or flying saucer. And they did. When the intelligence community got hold of that, and though the boys who were designing this, all this machinations for intelligence operation, they call them and said, no, you didn't. Uh, you found a weather balloon, didn't you? And they said, of course we did. So they went and found a weather balloon and brought it there on, on the uh, 
right there on TV and uh, and everything, and uh, said, "See there, look at this weather balloon." My point is this: as an intelligence operative, a former, you paid us to lie to you. Why are you amazed that 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 you? You believe the lie. <laughs> They're still lying to you. Russia, Russia collusion and all that. It was a lie. The whole thing, even their own investigation proved them to be wrong about it. My point is simply that lying is what the intelligence community does. That's what we, we did. The alien doesn't do any different. They make up stories. The alien is the primary absolute inventor of, of uh, false memory syndrome. They are the ones who did it. Screen and then, memories. They, they just did. They call screen memories. You can call them anything you want. We saw a three foot. You actually be, believe you saw a three foot out walking down the street with large black eyes talking to you at three o'clock in the morning? Probably not. I saw a big deer come in with large black eyes and it was talking to me. Probably it wasn't. Those are screens. Those are I saw my dead relative who looked kind of a pale green and he had strange large black eyes. He knocked on my door one night and I opened the door. Funny, no one else opened the door, but you did, just the abductee. How does that happen? Those are called screened memories. They're false memory syndrome. Very interesting. Um, to continue on with the, the other um, the other sighting or I guess uh, the event that I'd like to, to discuss with you, the Capitol flyover, I believe it was 1952, if I'm not mistaken. Um, can you tell us what you know about that? I can tell you some things you're not going to read or see on the news. Please. And okay. uh, one of them is you see these uh, objects uh, anywhere between uh, half a dozen or more flying around the Capitol building and around, uh, and it, it scared everybody half to death. Now, it was interesting from a media point of view because look at that. Whatever it is, those Foo Fighters or whatever they are, that's all, wow. How do you just, I mean, it's the old idea. Why don't they just land on the White House lawn? Well, they almost did. The problem was that uh, what, what you may not know is that I have flight log from the pilots that flew up against these UFOs. And I, I demanded that when they he first, when one of them first came to me and told me about it. I said, I have to have absolute evidence that you were there that night and I want to see your flight logs. He provide, I have them with me. They're, they're available. Uh, the second thing is I said, what happened? He said, well, after we went up there and chased them, they left, we came back and so on. And uh, he said, when we landed, uh, he said, we were put in separate rooms and they asked us what happened. And we told them the exact same story. They looked at us and said the following. Now, again, this is the intelligence people coming in. No, you didn't. What you saw was ionized air. You saw light inversions. That's what you saw, isn't it? Well, sir, isn't it? Uh, well, yes, sir, uh, because if it isn't uh, and you lied about it, you, if you go out and tell the people the different stories, because the other pilots are saying, this is what we saw the same thing you did, and it was uh, ionized air, it was light inversions, it was something else, swamp gas, whatever it was, it was up there. But it wasn't a UFO. Here, sign this document that says you're telling 100% truth right now. And they signed their under penalty of, uh, of uh, I think, $5,000 fine, uh, $10,000 fine and five years imprisonment. And if they there was that. nothing to see, then they would never have been asked to sign documents like that in the first place. It would just have been a routine thing. It's what I tell yeah. people about lying. If you don't lie, you don't have to remember what the lie was. If you're telling the truth, you don't have to. Well, anyway, I said, so how? what happened? He said, nobody threatens me as a military officer and gets away with it. He said, I, uh, I signed and uh, I, I resigned as an officer right there. My buddy stayed in. I got out and I became a commercial airline pilot with a major airline. He said, I just retired and I'm ready to talk to you about the whole thing. 
and he said, here are my records and so on. That's why are you talking now? He said, because it's all over. And he said, the fact is you're an investigator. You need to know. And he said, and here are my logs. And I said, well, what you don't know is that we had three roving anti-aircraft units. These are those same guys that can shoot down all kinds of things because we they were roving anti-aircraft batteries. And the reason they were there is because the government actually thought we were under attack from an alien presence that night. Okay, I have a question for you, Daryl. Um, in regards to some of the abduction scenes that you have been to, have you come across anything like handprints? I have. Uh, handprints are one of the things we look for because uh, in some of these events, the alien um, will leave their handprints in the most curious places. Uh, you see some of them there. Uh, the one handprint in the middle, it looks pure white. Uh, that was found on a car at an abduction scene. Uh, you, one might say, well, that was somebody did that on purpose. No, they actually didn't. The police came and took those that handprint off of the car, and we have it as forensic evidence to this day. That's number one. Number two, in that same event, a lady, a very good friend of mine, took two 8 by 10 color photographs of uh, the aliens that came inside the house. And I saw the, and I had the photographs analyzed, and they actually do show two different alien beings there, crystal clear. And uh, they're not Photoshopped. This is before Photoshopping existed. And uh, my, my point is that that hand is, was on the glass, but it was also on the car. That same hand shows up uh, 10 years before that in a case of mine in Pennsylvania on a, on a sheetrock wall. Exact same handprint, same size, everything. It also shows up in Romania, three stories up on a glass window. It also shows up in Italy on a glass window of one of my abductees homes. My point is what we're looking at is the same entities, maybe not the same entity, but the same styled entities, ones that are cloned, hats made, manufactured, in my opinion. And these type hands, the reason these are significant to me because it gives me an idea when I look at the hand shapes and types, what I'm looking at here tells me a lot about your experience. I don't care what you tell me. I was a school of higher consciousness and had drops of wisdom land on me and it just made me feel so wonderful. I don't care about the screen memory that you were given. What I do care about is what really happened. When I see those different types of hand prints, it gives me a fair idea of what uh, may have happened to you or what program that you may be in. They're not all the same. That one hand that was on the white sheet of paper and the, the one you just, that one, the one that's uh, second from the right on the very bottom looks like a white sheet of paper. That's a drawing by an artist of a handprint on her son's leg. She, I had her check it and it showed a particular color of fluorescence, a particular nanometer, and the uh, three long fingers uh, with a claw-like appendages on it and a thumb-like uh, opposing thumb. My point about that is the following. When I saw that, I was curious, and I've known this family for 30 years. So when I tell you these stories, I'm not telling you, oh, I know I have an abductee that told me a story. No, 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 no. I know these people personally and have for over 30 years. And I've watched that particular color of fluorescence on uh, and that hand kind on different abductees. And I've found that, that that rare fluorescence, when it shows up on an abductee's body, when it shows up, it tells wow. me the program that they're in. That particular program that's on that kid's leg caused him to change his sexual identity. Now, I am not opposed to pe pe people want to go out and change their sexual identity. That's their business. has nothing to do with me. 
I don't pick on anyone for any reason. What I'm telling you is this was not those people's choice. This was chosen for them by someone else. The last time I saw that particular fluorescence of that nanometer length and kind was on a man at a conference that I was speaking at. And he showed up and I said, uh, I pulled out my black light and he says, what's that for? And he was very nervous about it. I said, I just want to check you over to make sure you haven't been touched in the last 48 hours. And he, he finally agreed he didn't like it. I checked and I found the exact same fluorescence on him. And uh, my colleague looked at me and she said to me later, what does that mean? And I said, well, um, <laughs> uh, you're not going to like this because it sounds like like I'm opposed to somebody and I'm not. I said, I admire and, and like all of my abductees, contactees, I don't have any quote unquote uh, particular kinds that are better than others, so to speak. Uh, I said, it's highly likely that his sexual orientation, if it hasn't been changed, will be soon. Within a month's time, he left his wife, his kids, his family, a very lucrative job, and nobody knows where he's at other than he had sexual uh, reassignment surgery. Can you talk about this handprint? That handprint was found uh, on a woman on her front and uh, on her front stomach and her back. It, it, the handprint is a caustic burn, according to a doctor of a giant hand and uh, we made a duplicate of that hand of, of the exact size we thought it would be and it weighed it, i made it out of clay and it weighed approximately uh, 24 pounds to give you an idea how big the hand was it was big enough it went from one side of her body to the other and we think it was that of a polydactyl a giant that picked her up and left caustic burns on her front and her back side uh, on, the, on, on her back. And uh, the doctor was very puzzled by this whole thing of how that could have happened and what kind of hand could have done that. Uh, of course, he had no idea. Do we know if the patient, if this ever cleared up on the patient or is it just exactly the same as it now as it was then? Do we have that information? I don't. I do not have that information. I've got as much information as I could so far. Uh, when I go back to Chile, I will find out the rest of the story. I'll actually meet with the woman, and so on. But she became quite famous for a while because people were really stunned that this lasted so long on her. Fluorescence, which is like a biological uh, coloration that shows up on the in, invisible level, it will only show up under black light. Uh, when it shows up on an abductee, this is something that is either by, again, casual contact or a procedural contact by the alien. And uh, this stuff will not wash off. You will not get it off. Doctors have tried to remove it with chemicals and all kinds of products, all of which have failed. The body, will, uh, once the alien physically touches you, they often will leave this biological sweat is what I'd like to refer to it as on you. It penetrates your skin subdermally, practically on contact, and you can't get it off. The more you scrub, the lighter it will get. It will finally absorb, the body will absorb it uh, within 48 hours. Uh, in rare cases, it will last up to a couple of weeks, but that's very, very good. Well, um, if I may, let me ask you the, the, I guess the big question that probably everybody's uh, is thinking out there uh, on the chat and it's actually watching the program. Uh, since you're being as how you are a former uh, military, your former, uh, I'm sorry, former uh, law enforcement, uh, your former CIA, what is your gut feeling? What does your gut tell you that their agenda actually is? And do you actually have a, a theory on it? Uh, well, after... I've done this for a long time. So uh, I have uh, I have some, some distinct possibles 
that uh, that, that I have about the phenomena, uh, simply because of uh, my many years of work with it. Uh, I suspect that the alien is not uh, is not has not not only has not told us the truth. They don't intend to tell us the truth. They never have, and they never will. Uh, that's just the way it is. Uh, they operate like an intelligence agency, uh, and I can uh, underscore that I, by an answer two questions. One is uh, what I think they may be up to, and that they function like an intelligence community by telling you this quick story. In 1990, uh, I decided to test information. I, I'm a private investigator, and I used to function in the intelligence community. So getting information from people and from uh, it, you try to you, you test your your thesis out, your your ideas to see if they work. I found in working with thousands of abductees, I found one abductee that I thought saw things and heard things on board that craft he should not have heard and certainly was not supposed to be privy to. Fortunately, he didn't rem recall them, but I, I did whenever I got the information out of him. And then I installed amnesia back in him so he wouldn't remember. But I I thought if this information is real, uh, this is like uh, calling the CIA and say, oh, by the way, I've got some big secrets about you guys. And then you tell them. And in a few minutes, they're located at your house. And guess right. what? You're under arrest. And at best, you're going to be under a a watch list for at least the next 10 years, at least. So I took that information that I thought was very damning about the alien. And then I, I, I contacted a friend of mine who is a contactee. That means someone who likes the alien, thinks they're here to help us and do all kinds of wonderful things. And I said, I need to ask you a question and please help me if you will. And she said, you never charged anybody a dime. Uh, of course I will, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what do you need? I said, I need to borrow your brain. And she said, okay. And I said, I can't tell you what I'm going to do because it's, uh, it's, it's involved. And uh, I want to see if, if the alien will play, let's see if this information is valid. And she said, sure. And I said, fine. And I looked at her and smiled and said, are you ready? She says, yes. And I said, sleep. And she fell over. I filmed the whole thing. And I installed this information in her as if it were her own memory. I installed amnesia on the backside of it. So the alien couldn't, if they ever did find out about it, they couldn't find out where it came from. Me. I installed amnesia on the other side of her memory so that she wouldn't... Uh, say anything of her own will. So I set it to go off as a post-hypnotic suggestion during her next abduction. That happened about a month later. And in 1992, the alien came and picked her up, normal. I do that every several months with her. And she got within 18 inches of this guy, 18 to 20 inches. And all of a sudden, she just blurted out a bunch of information that she said it's the only time I ever saw an alien gray get scared. Said he had fear on his face. I've never seen that before. And uh, I said, why is that? And she said, I don't know. I don't know what I said. Well, that's good. I didn't want her to know. But she did say something I wish she hadn't have said, but it worked out in our favor anyway. She told the alien, Daryl knows what you're doing. She said, it's amazing to me. They all know your name. They know who you are. They know what you're doing. I said, of course they do. Uh, anyway, I said, they know who every one of us are that are involved in this phenomenon. They know that. It's not like it's a big secret. So they came back on December 8th, 1992. They picked up eight of our abductees in two states and several cities. They took small craft and took them to a very large craft uh, near the moon, uh, and the craft was approximately 600 miles across, 50 miles thick. You say, well, why would they do that? 
Well, a couple of reasons. Number one is I told you these beings are made, hatched, cloned, and manufactured for the purpose of making you think they're aliens from other planets. The fact is their DNA probably comes from here. But the bottom line is the reason they're not from another planet, so to speak, is because they have a craft that are so huge, so immense, some of them thousands of miles across, and we have video of them, that uh, it, it's, it, you know, <laughs> why do you need a planet when you move this thing around anywhere you want it? I mean, right. it, it can house everything you've ever wanted. You know, you don't need a planet. So uh, how we got when I, my senior investigator was one of the people taken. When he came back up from the event, he uh, his fingernails were growing very rapidly, and he said, "Oh my God!" He said, "I've been taken. You've got to work and find out what happened." I did, and he described to us several people how I did it and why I did it. They were really upset, uh, and if you're in, in the intelligence business, all this makes sense. Somebody just broke your system. They got in. What are you going to do about that? So you're going to find the leak, of course, and patch it up and fix it. Uh, I'm not saying that the alien was terrified in the sense of the word, we know all their big secrets. I'm not saying that. I'm saying we broke into, we broke in and they were upset to no end that they would send a craft 50 miles thick, 600 miles across and send these small craft to it so that these two guys could interview these two people. And the, the big answer to your question, I'm going to give you three quick answers. These, these two guys I call mid-level management had the uh, seven different flavors of alien, with the little gray, the tall gray, the, uh, the mantis being, et cetera, et cetera. All of them were standing in front of this, the head guy sitting in the big chair. And they were scared to death of this guy. He was, well, I call mid-level management. He was their boss, to say the very least. And they live in a society we have no concept of. And fear is the basis of it. Anyway, they, uh, the head guy there asked these two people the same questions. And uh, absolutely amazing questions. When I produced a human brain, a, a, a holographic image of a human brain in front of my senior investigator, and he, now this is an amazing statement. If they know everything, why don't they know everything? And he had Dale point, he said, point, and he had this holographic image of a human brain in front of his face, and he said, point to the human soul. Where is it? Now, why does an alien want to know that? In the other room, the lady was asked the same question. She said, "They, she said, I used the term a computer screen because I don't know what it was. It wasn't a computer, but there was a screen and said they it produced a human brain. And the, the guy in the big chair looks at me and says, point to the human spirit. Where is it located? They didn't know. And they wanted to know desperately. And the third question they asked, well, second question was, how did Daryl do it? And why did he do it? Of course, neither one of them had a clue. And I didn't want them to know. If I had their abductees, I said, well, you would have told them everything. They said, well, of course we would have. I said, that's why I don't tell you guys anything. Why would I? <laughs> it's like telling the alien everything. And uh, the second big question, they, the third big question they laid out was, what is, what is Prometheus, Project Prometheus? Project Prometheus, in my view, is a, a military intelligence program designed to steal technology from the alien for the quote unquote service of man. Service of man in the intelligence community means we're in charge of it and you don't ever get to know about it. There's been a lot of stuff stolen from the service of man. Uh, we know of some of those items like zero point energy and anti gravity and a whole bunch of other things. Um, that could uh, dramatically change our world for, for, from the way it is now. So, yeah, we've been limited due to that. Yep. The, the answer to the question, I think, is implicit in my statement. They want to know where the human soul was, where the human 
uh, spirit was because they did not know where it was and they want to know what the intelligence right. community was up to. So right. if that gives you a clue as to what the alien, why would they ask those questions instead of, you know, uh, how's the ecology doing on your planet? That sort of thing. They know your, your ecology. They've known it for a thousand years. They know all of it. They know all of that. They don't care about why don't they abduct your your green scientists and everything because they know more infinitely more than they do and they can care less. That's a right. ruse. That's a that's a false flag. It's a it's a red herring. It's a, it's a cover story. It's what we use in the intelligence community. It's false. Right. Okay, one thing I wanted to step back a little bit and ask you a question of is. Are the abductions within your family still continuing? Mine stopped at age uh, 17. They stopped very violently uh, at age 17. Uh, five entities showed up in my room at age 17 that weren't alien. Okay. They're what I call the ones who made, hatched, cloned, and manufactured the alien. Uh, let me explain that a little bit. Um, a lady asked me one time this last week, she says, um, I think the aliens are pushing all these pieces of the puzzle around in humanity and they're doing this, doing that. I said, well, it's, 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 it's an interesting concept. I said, but I think you, I think it's bigger than that. She says, what do you mean? I said, well, if the alien is the one doing all these different things and pushing this around and that, and doing all that, the so-called greys and the mantis and these guys and so on. If that's, let's assume that's the case. I said, you need to imagine a pair of hands above the alien with strings going down to the alien. And you're, the guy up here is, a mar is using them as a marionette. They are literally avatars for someone else. Well, we've actually heard rumors that the, the gray alien is actually a manufactured being. We've also heard rumors that there's actually a galactic federation, a co-op, if you will, out there, um, of which obviously we're not a part of because we're too primitive. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, the, the, the galactic co-op uh, I have a problem with because it, it's, it's straight out of Star Trek. A lot of the stuff is. Uh, and it's applied directly to the alien with uh, the Star Trek imagery and so on. Um, number two uh, answer is that uh, I, I suspect that the, uh, the, uh, the, the you, you had two questions. One was the, about the alien co-op and the other one was uh, the gray alien. Uh, the, the fact ah. that the short gray is a manufactured creature versus you know, a living being, if you will. It's a great question. Uh, when I was four years old, I realized there was something wrong with this picture. And I can't believe that as many people have seen the alien, they either spend time doing one or two things, either in stark terror, fear, or in awe. The only problem with those two positions, if you're using them when the alien's presence, is you're not listening, you're not you're not picking up the information you need to be getting from the alien. He can switch you off anytime he wants, but if you know how to do it, you can switch yourself back on. I learned how to do that when I was age four. The reason I've learned so much about the alien is because I've read a lot of books. I haven't. I don't care about books. Most of those books are written by people who really don't know or who, li who are living off of the screen memories that they perceive to be the quote unquote truth. The fact is, the intelligence, uh, they, they operate like an intelligence operation. Why would they give you all their big secrets when they're keeping it from everyone else? So that you can print a book about it and say, oh, I know all the big secrets. Well, I have a problem with that. So what we found out is uh, from age four all the way through this as I began to study it, I began to realize that, uh, again, I, I'm the alien hunter. I hunted those that hunted me, and then later they came and hunted my son. I was content to leave well enough alone until they came after my kid. You come after me, I can live with it. You come after my children, I don't care what planet you think you're from, I'll find you. And then I'm going to find out a lot more about you, things you don't want me to know. My point about that is this. 
since then, uh, I took one lady uh, with, a, with commercial airline pilot was one of my uh, specialized students doing some of this work. And uh, she was crying. She says, they're, they're going to get my children. They said, if I gave you any more information, they're going to get my children. I said, do you think they're going to get them anyway? And she said, yes. I said, then it really doesn't matter whether I help you or not. In that sense of the word. But I said, but out of the out of the kindness of my heart and the fact that I believe people ought to be protected in any way they can, I, I, I did some really neat things with her. And uh, the next time the alien, about two months later, came in the room, she tore his eye cover about half off. It was hanging there. And the second time he came in about two months later, she tore the eye cover completely off. Underneath the eye cover, which, and that's what it was, I figured that out at age four because I could see a little red light underneath the black eye cover. Even at age four, I couldn't figure out what that was all about. But so I just decided to exploit that information, that memory, when I was a child. And she tore the eye cover off and found a red stippled screen with five little line, white lines running across, like in, you might see in a in a hospital, as an example, on a like on a, like on an oscilloscope, five of them running across that red stippled screen of an eye. By that, indicated he was biomechanical. Some of these beings, I believe, are completely biological. Some, like him, are biomechanical. Some of them appear to be completely by, completely mechanical, and they even move together in synchronicity, like three or four of them at a time, and they literally look like machines moving towards you. They're literally like that. So I think you may have at least three different kinds, and uh, we can talk about the biology and the other stuff later if you want. Uh, kind of like the one at uh, the aliens at Pascagoula, they move like robots. Very much so in some sense of the word. It depends or whether or not he is being used as an avatar. Uh, most right. of the little greys have an IQ. We've done a lot of work on this. I mean a lot. Uh, the small grey has an IQ of approximately 80. He's about that a, mor a moron. And that's why they can't get your clothes on right. They can't, they put you in the wrong bed, the wrong location. They put you, I mean, they just do, they make huge mistakes. Uh, <clears throat> the taller gray, the doctor type, is uh, a lot smarter. He's got an IQ of about 135, 140. He's, if any cutting or surgery is going to be done on you, so to speak, or mutilation, if you will, uh, he's the one that's going to do it in most cases. The mantis being has got an IQ of about 175 or 180. He's extremely intelligent. My point is each of these beings are made, hatched, cloned, and manufactured for the purpose of doing very specific jobs, very specific work. So uh, would you uh, suspect then that Earth is some type of laboratory for these uh, beings? No, I, I think that uh, I think it. One of the things that Valet and others have come across, uh, John Keel, and others uh, older guys who studied this long ago. Uh, they they came up with some pretty good strong ideas uh, that there's some other something far bigger going on that we have an idea about. Uh, uh, Valet and others, and I'm one of them, uh, will tell you that. You can't, you can't uh, look at this phenomena. And, 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 and let me back up a little bit. Everybody's got a UFO hat. I have seven hats I wear for my investigations. Seven. My UFO hat has been fooled, like many people in the UFO community. The UFO hat wants to believe all kinds of stuff, and it will. But it gets fooled. We've been fooled by some of the best liars. The CIA hope you're wearing a UFO hat. You know why? Because it's easy to fool. And they've been doing it for years. Uh, <clears throat> the second hat I have is a cop hat. That hat, obviously, uh, is tough. It intimidates people. 
they often don't like it when I wear that hat because it doesn't believe anything you say. You're going to have to prove it. You're going to have to convince me. Third hat we have is a medical hat, which we do for our surgeries and so on. We use the Bayesian logic to de decipher a lot of information. We have science hats that we use to analyze all that data. But I also have an intelligence hat. The intelligence hat doesn't give a hoot about hardly any of them. It only cares about one thing, what's really going on. In other words, it, it's more interested in those three questions I mentioned to you. It's, they're not, they don't really give a hoot about, you know, are they here to barbecue us, eat us, or uh, upgrade us, or whatever. They know that's not true. They knew that from the beginning. They already know that. They're so far past that, it's pathetic. They're into other area, other questions. And they literally, uh, the intelligence community is, it, they, it's, it's awful to have to say it this way, but uh, they, they, they know a, lo a lot more than you or they're, they're going to tell you. But I can, uh, the alien lies, they lie consistently. Uh, they lie just like the intelligence community. I've said that over and over and over, and they do. This is one of the big things that I, I told you I was stunned about in the spycraft school. The alien phenomena of contact is so much like the disinformation programs of the CIA, the Mossad, and the KGB that it is stunning. We lied about everything in the CIA, even things we didn't have to lie about. And so does the alien. And if you don't understand that statement I just made, you're never going to understand the UFO phenomena from an intelligence point of view. You're going to be wearing a UFO hat say, saying things like, well, they come from the Pleiades and that's, and or Zeta Reticuli, and that, that, and therefore they're looking to upgrade their species. And those are whoppers they have been telling abductees and contactees forever. It simply ain't true. It's a great story, but a UFO hat loves to hear this stuff. The intelligence hat already knows better than that. They're way past you. What do you think about uh, the efforts of uh, Lou Elizondo? Uh, I met Lou Elizondo uh, uh, some time ago, uh, only briefly, over the phone of, through a, 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 a a buddy of his that was in the uh, in Afghanistan. We're all buddies and friends. We were, and uh, we were called him. And he wanted me to meet Lou personally and all that. And uh, I uh, I enjoyed him. I, I thought he was a good egg. Uh, I think he's got a, a tough row to hoe, so to speak, ahead of himself. Uh, he finally quit the outfit that he was involved in, and I think I, I would have. If I were him, uh, I think I would have. Uh, I did quit the agency, and, uh, and I have my own reasons. Uh, they want to control everything. They're not about humanity knowing everything. They're not a. Hey, if this whole thing is affecting planet Earth, why isn't it the people on planet Earth don't get to choose? That's right. called. That's called. Uh, uh, that's not democracy. That's an autocracy. I get to keep information. Manipulation. I, I don't like people. The CIA or nobody should make the whole decision for us as a nation or us as a, a planet. Nobody should have that authority. We should be given the sufficient information so that we can make an, an informed decision. And I think that's where Lou uh, was running into a, a brick of rock in a hard place uh, because uh, these people. Some of them want the information out, a lot of them don't, and they they will use your intelligence level. I have a top secret clearance, uh, and I meet I meet I meet people all the time that claim they have these high level clearances, and they're telling you big secrets. The CIA told me this yesterday. That just ain't true. Not true. If it is true, why aren't you in in, in a thing called a rendition? Rendition is a is a place that you're going to go when you spill the beans on top level intelligence information that you should have never ever said, and you get, you get, we cost us all kinds of money and time and you aided in the bed of the enemy. It's a prison you go to that's not in country. It's not recorded. 
and it, rendition is a real experience. I can promise you, I was threatened with it myself when I was in CIA. And uh, these people telling you, I have deep contacts inside the CIA. They tell me everything. No, they don't, because first of all, they don't know everything. Uh, that information is compartmentalized in special access programs, and you don't just walk in there and do whatever. I'm top secret clearance, and I can't even carry the luggage of some of these people. And I mean, right. their clearances are higher than mine, and and uh, and they know things I'll never know. Uh, probably, I may know things about the alien they don't know. The reason they don't know it's because they're not an abductee. They learn how to break the aliens. Uh, uh, system of thinking to the point that I could spy. I could. I, I'm not particularly smart. I just overheard what they said. And when you can do that for 13 years, you learn a lot about the alien. You never sure. thought you could ever know. And one of the things you learn very quickly, they're not telling you the truth. And they're not really here to help us because if they were, why didn't they stop World War One, World War Two, Vietnam? Uh, Nagasaki, Hiroshima, uh, Afghanistan, all of that. Why didn't they intercede on our behalf? You're asking, not all right You're asking right. the right questions. You're asking the right questions. Right, they're not here. <clears throat> well, uh, they just go ahead and land. Why don't they? Why don't they meet with me privately and tell me all the big secrets? I've got about twenty big questions I want to ask the alien personally, and my contactee friends have told me they're in contact with the alien constantly. I said, good, have them come to my house alone. I will not have any weapons, nothing. Uh, and I want to ask them these big questions. And out of every one of the people that promised me the alien was coming, no alien has ever shown up at any time to answer any one of the questions. All of the questions, I assure you, are such questions that if the alien answers them, he will be infuriated when he hears them because he, he will divulge his own intelligence operation if he answers them. Well, good. We hope you actually get that chance. Mm -hmm. I'm still waiting. Well, I'll tell you, Daryl, um, really great, really great story. Uh, your thoughts are, are really interesting on the subject. Uh, we really, really appreciate you being here, sir. You've been a fantastic guest. Um, in fact, we'd like to invite you back for another round if uh, if you're up to it. Oh, um, absolutely. Sure a lot you more guys are awesome. You ask the right questions. You think you're smart, and that's uh, – I. Smart people never have intimidated me, and I, I like it because when smart people get together, they ask, they get their different hats on, and they start questioning each other's mm -hmm. hats. And the problem is when you question people that only have one hat, a UFO hat, uh, they'll right. get mad real quick. They get upset because right. they can't think outside that hat. Absolutely. Well, anyway, uh, we want to thank everybody for coming out. As always, uh, what a wonderful show. Everybody uh, in the chat room, thanks for your participation out there. Everybody that's out there watching us, thanks a lot. Really appreciate it. Also, the people that have been coming out to the new UFO Men show that we've been doing on Thursday evenings at 9 o'clock Eastern time. Um, we're going to continue to do that. Uh, having a lot of fun over there. I know Tim and I are just so uh, we can get kind of get laid back a little bit and, uh, you know, and, and have a little bit more fun with the subject. And uh, what do you think there, Tim? Yeah, I do agree. Um, hope everybody will come back and see us on Thursday. Also, uh, if you like Daryl Sims, please go to um, Amazon and pick up at least one of his books. Uh, I think it's this book, right, Daryl, that's on Amazon? You can, or you, you can go to our website. It's called TheAlienHunter.com, TheAlienHunter.com. And go to that, and you can click on my name, and it'll it'll automatically email me. I'll answer your questions if you've got any. The service is free, and uh, our books, my books, are not written for entertainment. They're written for you to find evidence, just like I did. They're not ent entertainment books. They're written right. to show you how to go in the field and find it yourself. They're factual. I do have one last question before we end the show. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your um, show that you had, your TV show, Uncovering Aliens? Oh, yes. Uncovering Aliens, an uh, interesting show. Um, I, I, I'm i still under some contractual agreements that I can't talk about. But the bottom line is that uh, uh, we, we actually beat Bigfoot when it was on at the same time. Our ratings were hugely high. 
but uh, anyway, for some reason, they finally canceled it after four. Uh, uh, that uh, anyway. Long story short, I enjoyed the show. I love the producers, love the directors. It's a, a good outfit and uh, uh, l- lovely people. I, I enjoyed working with them. But we we saw some some great stuff. Actually, saw a black helicopter right in the middle of our filming one day. I mean, up close, very very up close. We literally filmed it. Why it didn't get in the final cut, I have no idea. Um, can this uh, TV show still be viewed online? And if so, where? Uh, I understand they, the, the shows can still be seen. I don't, I don't have the location. Sometimes, sometimes they, they change. They'll switch to different uh, venues. I don't know why. But uh, the show is Uncovering Aliens. If you, you, you put, look, check it out in different formats, uh, IMDb or or other formats, you'll probably find it on, or Google, you'll probably find it on there. But if I locate it myself, you can email me and say, hey, did you find that where the program's at? I'll be glad to send them to you free of charge, of course, because we'd like you to see the show. Cool, that sounds very great. So as Tommy said, thanks to everybody who participated in the chat, everybody who participated online, and we wanna thank Daryl Sims for sharing his time with us. You've been very gracious, sir. Thank you. Um, So everybody, please come and join us on Thursday for UFO Men Live. And we will share some more UFO news and some other stories as well. And as always, from all of us on the panel, good night.